Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Come on. I'm melting as well as you are melting. Yeah, okay. I, I don't want to hear my voice, therefore I'm looking for the position and that seems to be a good one. Okay, I'm not gonna go to repeat all the criteria about uh, transitional justice because you heard them. Only one additional point would be the Special Rapporteur for Cultural Rights gave recommendations how important it is, right to culture, to connect to the idea of memorialization uh, in terms of museums, monuments, whatever, in societies uh, that have post-conflict history. It's, can we turn it a bit? Or? So, uh, and what she's saying is difficult challenges encountered in memorialization and the most important part of it should be to stimulate and promote civic engagement, critical thinking in the process of reconciliation and transitional justice, and discussion regarding the representation of the past, but equally the contemporary challenges of exclusion and violence in a society after a conflict or war. I have been working for decades on the Balkans and therefore I have now found or I've been choosing three examples that are closely connected to the values of Documenta, which means collaboration and collectivity. So the first one is, if you give me the next slide, <coughs> the red line in Sarajevo. For the 20th anniversary of the besiege of Sarajevo, they did but then I'm hearing myself all the time. <laughs> so, they can hear you online. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you have to know Sarajevo was under besiege for 44 months, concretely 1,425 days if anybody can imagine these figures. And the interesting thing is that Sarajevo was partially divided in terms of a part was then occupied by the Serb troops, but the remaining people in Sarajevo, they really stick together. They have been fighting the aggression from outside, no matter of their ethical or religious background. So there was a Serb general in the first line uh, protecting Sarajevo and, and Croats and Bosniaks and all together. And that's an important thing because they have been commemorating this 20th anniversary with this installation and in total in these 44 months 11,541 people have been killed in Sarajevo. Because the geographical location of Sarajevo is there are hills around and the aggressors have been sitting up there and shelling down to the city. And they have been in a really big disadvantage, the population of, of Sarajevo. Can you give me the next slide? So, I hope you can see it. The idea was to place 11,541 red chairs for each victim one chair. It was nearly one kilometer and it included as well specific chairs for the 643 children. They bring smaller one, you know. And all of that was planned really collectively with the citizens of Sarajevo, with artists, the city council. And it was not only this sort of drama and the theater, but accompanied by uh, concerts, uh, theater plays, you know, and whole Sarajevo would come and be on the feet. 
and they would then give honor and tribute to the victims by putting flowers on the chair for the children, you know, beers, uh, toys, uh, candies. And this was a very, very important sort of common feeling that they stayed together again. And there was a huge uh, choir of students, 700 students participated in the choir. And at the end, they would stand along these 800 or 900 meters and uh, sing the song, uh, Give Peace a Chance, after 20 years, you know. And at the same time, you have to know that at the International Tribunal uh, Court for ex Yugoslavia, the two main responsible people, Stanislav Galic and Dragomir Milosevic, have been sentenced because of the crime that happened in terms of destroying and killing people in Sarajevo. So here you see the double sort of uh, line, how uh, and how important it is to have justice in court and then this sort of restorative or symbolic uh, justice for the people by honoring the victims and giving them this common feeling uh, that they stick together even after 20 years. Um, maybe we have now the short uh, video. If you have the link, this is the director who created the idea with uh, the city of Sarajevo. Yeah, here we have it. Okay, thank you. Can you give me the next slide, please? <coughs> so. Okay, so the next project is about Srebrenica, I mean, you, our students know the genocide in Srebrenica and as well in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, the people have been killed not only during the uh, genocide but around Srebrenica as well. And uh, that's a very, very participative project um, by, uh, can you give me the next one? Next. Aida Shehovic, she is an artist, a conceptual artist living um, between Sarajevo and New York. And she had to leave the country as a refugee and now she's a migrant, uh, as I said, mainly living in the US. And she talked to the especially women from Srebrenica because as you know, as you know, these 8,400 uh, 43 or something victims have, have been mainly male. And these women told her, you know, most what I'm missing is sitting with my husband, with my brother, with my son, 
and having coffee, Bosnian coffee. I'm still getting goosebumps. You have to understand the coffee ceremony is something very, very specific in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And they do Bosnian coffee, not Turkish coffee, because it's a way how they prepare it. There is a bit of difference. The coffee ceremony is something where people sit in the morning, in the afternoon, and share not only coffee. They are sharing ideas. They are sharing feelings. They are sharing experiences. They are giving support to each other. And that's so crucial. And Aida, since she's now living in New York, she only realized by being a migrant where you have coffee to go. I mean, what sort of coffee culture is just coffee to go? You grab a coffee and go in the street. I mean, and then when she talked to these women and they said, I'm really missing my husband, my son, uh, not being able, having coffee with him, so they are not here. And therefore the whole installation is called Stotenema, means why aren't you here? You are not here. Where are you, I mean? Uh, can you give me the next one? <clears throat> so she started this installation. There should be image. <laughs> okay. By collecting the cups that are used for this traditional ceremony in Bosnia, they are called, here they are, Filjani. Filjani is only these exactly cup. In the beginning, you saw the pattern that are uh, painted. And the first installation she did in Sarajevo, in Bascasia, which is the old part of, of Sarajevo, with a couple of cups, but these cups have been donated by the families of the victims of Srebrenica. And she took care of it. And then the project, and that was on 11th of July, which is a commemoration day of the genocide in, in Srebrenica. So then she started to discuss and got more and more cups donated. And the idea is that not only victims or families of victims, but other people as well can donate a filjan, but it has to be a real one, not just any cup. It has to be, I mean, the one they use. And coming sort of from the heart and having a message. Because she said it would have been easy to buy them. No problem, I mean, you go there cheap, but that's not the idea. The idea is this participation of a society. And since her first installation, she did this in 14 different, 14 different cities of the world. And it's always upon an invitation. It's not that she's coming and telling Banja Luka, now I will do the installation but people are inviting her and then the community there, either at NGOs or individuals, they are preparing the whole ceremony. And now at the end, they have already, give me the next slide please, more than 9,000 of these filjanis. And this year, it came back to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And this ceremony is only done once a year on the 11th of July so far. It was in New York, it was in Chicago, it was in Venice at the Biennale. And again, not the artist is doing the whole ceremony. They start with small amount of cups and they are preparing the coffee. So people smell the coffee and are coming by and there are no signs of advertisement or flags, nothing. Some volunteers supporting her, and then participants can come and fill one of the filters with coffee. And so the installation is growing. It takes usually a whole day, as you can imagine, to prepare coffee for eight to 9,000 cups and to fill them. And in, in the evening, when it's finished, they just dismantle it, they pack it. Can you give me the next, next image? Yes, you see? And so that's the way how 
the, the cups are traveling, and now they will be finally end up in Potocari, which is the monument for Srebrenica. And the idea behind, she says, it's a monument for human beings and for humanity. And therefore, she's not talking about victims being Bosniaks, Muslims, or whatever. It's an idea that we have to fight genocide as people, as human beings, and therefore, everybody can participate. And the talks, when the whole ceremony is done, is actually participative by the people who are coming. The project does not function if there is no community involvement and collaboration. That are the really main issues of it. And they have, as I said, more than uh, 9,000 cups, and they have been coming from all over the world, like from Ethiopia, because you know the conflict in Eritrea and then of Ethiopia, and there's a special coffee ceremony as well in Ethiopia. And now she says this is a monument for the world, for, for mankind, for human beings. And she completely rejects to have any participation of politicians or, I mean, any symbolic way of sort of um, hijacking this idea or manipulating it. Uh, it's a sort of, and the diaspora was heavily involved in all the places she has been in Chicago, in um, New York, uh, in Canada, as far as I remember. And if we now connect it to the uh, idea of, of transition justice, it is a nomadic monument. It's a process going, as you see, all over the year. It's memorialization. It's to honor the victims. At the same time, it gives the survivors, the families, the feeling not being alone. Because that was what they felt when it happened to them. Because nobody was, was with them. They had been alone losing the beloved I mean, family members, and it's a sort of a catharsis at the same time for, for them. It's a sort of a contribution to non-repetition, although as you can imagine, all of that a small contribution and transitional justice is never perfect and it takes decades. It's a process. This symbolic gesture will be uh, going on every 11th July, but now she's designing this nomadic uh, monument uh, in a new way for Potocari, for the big place where the people or the remainings of the victims have been buried, although some of them still, some bodies have not been found yet, and therefore she says as of by, I mean, coffee, the coffee ceremony is always something where you wait for somebody. Somebody is coming. So this is a, the families have been waiting for the bodies of, of their beloved so long. They have been missing. And usually you do all this more coffee because somebody could come and therefore you have to have a spare cup. And she connected this cultural background and is in embedding uh, it into the whole uh, process. And she considers herself as uh, the initiator and the guardian of the project and not being the project. Can you give, yeah, sorry. Do you see the, some of the patterns? Then she's doing uh, workshops, panels, uh, to talk especially to the young people about what is genocide and, and again, not connecting it only to, to Srebrenica but, but to happenings uh, in the whole world. She did in Canada in the Human Rights Museum, a huge workshop, for example. Can you give me the link here?
Ukraine. Thank you. As you know, there's still no real peace and reconciliation on all levels in Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially not on the level of governments and political parties. But within the civil society, a lot has been achieved. And again, it was very important that parallel you had the courts, uh, the International Criminal, uh, uh, the ICTY for ex-Yugoslavia, we are the main responsible people for the genocide in Srebrenica have been brought to court, Karadzic, Mladic, and others. And that was as well a very important part, but as it's not enough. There's much more needed to, to find, I mean, this reconciliation process to go in the right direction. Okay, and the last example I have, if you go on, thank you, Marilyn. It's thinking of you. And this is uh, in Kosovo, the artists Alketa Shafa Mripa had the idea to break the silence about rape during the war in Kosovo. Because for nearly 20 years, that was a non-topic. Very few small talks, panels, and women, and whoever have been uh, sort of half public, but not the wider public was somehow concerned about this issue. It was somewhere in the hidden. These women have been suffering, not able even to get any sort of recognition. So the idea of Alketa was to invite First of all, women who are survivors of sexual violence in the war in Kosovo, but not only them, to bring skirts or whatever they have, a t-shirt. And she collected 5,000 of them and exposed them in the main stadium of Pristina. And, you know, very, I mean, Normal uh, women would donate their skirts, or a woman would say, this is my wedding dress. Another would say, this is a dress, it's a very, uh, not dirty, um, so sorrow and uh, sad history. Because she was beaten, uh, she, she had experienced uh, violence, domestic violence. Or Dua Lipa, I mean, the most famous Kosovarian singer, she would donate one of the dresses. So it was a campaign that started, and it was supported by, by the former president. And the idea was, as I said, breaking the silence, and as a consequence, a campaign had the success that at the end of the day, the parliament of Kosovo, the assembly of Kosovo, passed a law that the women survivors of sexual violence in, in this period have been considered to be veterans of the war. And they got reparations in terms of, they had to go through a certain process to be recognized as, as victim of sexual violence. But at the end, they got the same status as some fighters got after the, um, after the war. And it's very important because in the society, in very, in often in traditional societies, sexual violence is still considered to be sort of a fault of the women because the women are dishonoring the family, the women are dishonoring the society. And this was such an important step to go out to a wider public and simply to state, sorry, these women are victims. I mean, there is no guilt, no fault that can put on them. And at the same time, I think the symbolic is so important because to choose a soccer stadium as a sort of symbol of masculinity and very dominated by men and transform it in a place where people are honoring and remembering sexual violence, 
I mean, committed by men. That's a very, very important issue. And redefining the space as something not only being for, for men and for masculinity. And a statement from, uh, from the artist, from Arketa is, I use art with a restorative and transformative power to be a vehicle for raising awareness, empower and give platform to survivors of sexual violence to come forward and to speak up. We must reach everyone in society and use all means at our disposal to end the intolerable suffering once and for all. Two years ago, the first survivor, her name is Goodman, she went out and spoke about her case. And she is, has been testifying in court. Unfortunately, the perpetrator is not in the country. He was not finally sentenced, but at least the court case was filed. So these are examples that give you a sort of an insight about the power of arts and especially in a non-traditional way, because all these monuments are sort of not permanent, but giving a different perspective. And can you give me the last link about this? <clears throat> yeah, the upper one. Thank you so much. I know you are suffering, but thank you for being support. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. marathon of cases. Um, we're going to now introduce our colleagues at BART, Oscar and Hannah, who are going to be on the internet, I mean over, uh, I guess, equivalent of Zoom or whatever, you know. Um, and they're going to uh, talk a little bit about a couple of cases that they have. Do you see them there? Yeah, they had, they couldn't travel also, so they're going to be with us. Um, through there, and I hope that we can, can we expand the camera a little bit bigger? Sorry, the, the, the screen a little bit bigger? Wonderful. Oscar, can you hear me? Wonderful. Hannah, can you hear me? Excellent. So, just give it one second and then get comfortable. We're going to have another wonderful workshop. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yes, perfect. Uh, Marin, okay. Oscar, take it away. Oscar, Hannah, take it away. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm having a little bit of an echo, but okay, okay. Let me start working with this. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for having us. Uh, my name is Oscar Pedraza. I'm a fellow at uh, the Center for Human Rights and the Arts at Bard College right now. Also, I work with the Columbia Trade Commission. This is Hannah Martin. Um, Hi. I'm sorry. I have, I have COVID. 
So I'm a little bit not super able Oscar, to presentation. Oscar, if, if you could speak a little bit slower and and closer to the mic so we can uh, listen to you uh, in a better way. Okay. Um, is this better? Much better. Okay. Hello. <laughs> um, okay. Um, yeah, we are sorry that we couldn't be there with you guys. Um, we found out that we had COVID when we were about to get on the plane. Um, and we've been <laughs> struggling with this um, the last week. Um, now I'm feeling a little bit better, but Hannah is in and out. So I'll try to do it, uh, the presentation myself for the most part, and Hannah will jump in when she feels um, that the pain of COVID is letting her turn it. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I will present something uh, in this screen. I will share the screen uh, right now as well. Um, let's see if things work. You know what? Wait, what? we share for a second. I like a better idea for sharing. Give me a sec. Uh, yeah, tell Stop me. sharing. Okay, now go to share. Okay. And then go to window. And okay. then go to bank. Okay. So you can share that. So, can I see it? Hello? Okay. Hi, everybody. Okay, good. <laughs> it's just it's important that, um, so we're sure that we have no problems. Okay, like this? Yeah, you have to press play. So I, you get I know. Like okay. Um, so next Tuesday, the Colombian Truth Commission, which is part of the transitional system created um, after the signing of the peace accords uh, with FARC in 2016, FARC is a Colombian guerrilla, um, one of the oldest in Latin America. Um, the Truth Commission will release its report on the reasons and development of war in the country. Um, a few days ago, um, the leaders of FARC faced a three day long discussion uh, at the Transitional Justice Court listening to the victims of their practice of kidnapping and forced disappearance. The Sunday before this, so you know, a week ago exactly, Gustavo Petro, uh, a former member of the M19 guerrilla, which we're going to talk a little bit about it today, uh, that, that you know, this guerrilla signed a peace accord with the Colombian government in 1990, uh, became a president. So Petro um, became a president. The succession, this succession of events make it seem like a transitional dream is coming true. Uh, redemption in the form of democratic reconciliation. The day in which Petro gave his speech, the mother of Dylan Cruz, a teenager killed by a, um, by a anti riot police in Bogota during the first wave of national strike, uh, strikes in 2019, took the microphone to, congr to congratulate Petro and demand justice for his, for his son. Since the death of Dylan Cruz, hundreds of protesters have been beaten, dozens lost their eyes by anti-riot police shots, while others have been murdered or disappeared. In the rural areas, the promise of peace has been shattered. Instead, uh, new armed groups have been created, while others that existed before 2016 intensified their activities. The victims of state terror practice, this, the victims of state terror practices like enforced disappearance are largely still waiting for, for answers. And the victims of land dispossession conducted by paramilitary groups in collusion with the state bureaucracies, the army and private companies do not know if they will ever get their lands back. Colombia is living a transitional process in the midst of war. We were in charge of a collaboration between forensic architecture and the Colombian Truth Commission, conducting three visual investigations on three different cases. Land dispossession in a banana enclave in the Caribbean of Colombia, um, an emblematic case of forced disappearance in 1985 in Bogota, and the destruction of the Amazon and indigenous territory uh, of the Nuka people in the 
southern part of Colombia, the Amazon. Um, we also conducted an investigation in alliance with Bellingcat, um, Zero, Zero 7 Zero magazine, um, and Baudot, which is a small agency of news, um, about the murder of Lucas Villa, um, a protester assassinated during the second wave of the nationalist strike in 2021, basically a year ago, almost exactly. Although our work with the Truth Commission focused mostly in cases that occurred in 1980s and the beginning of this century, our analysis was constantly interpolated by the present. Our analysis was not driven by the standardized aspirations of transitional justice, namely the idea of a progressive linearity of the stages that move from war, followed by the moment of transition as coming to terms with the past and the ending with the formation of a democratic society in reconciliation. Our work is a history of the present, defined by the impossibility of a sequential articulation of the past, and instead forced us to deal with the multiple forms of violence that continuously reverberate in the contemporary, challenging the expectations of transitional justice and the conceptual and metho methodological arrangements that have been often used to conduct visual investigations about events and process of violence. I'm going to show you uh, briefly, or you know, as briefly as I can, uh, two of these cases. Uh, well, I will start with the, um, the case of uh, Palace of Justice. Um, this is this is an image of the many different images that we collected, um, and we started this work, which is based on um, the siege and counter siege um, that occurred in the Palace of Justice, that is in downtown Bogota in 1995, uh, in which first 13 persons were disappeared. And then later it was found out that around 21 or 22 persons were disappeared, tortured, and murdered. Uh, and very few things have, um, have been known of this person since. Um, one of the things that we started working with is the idea that the fact that information is public or is supposedly available doesn't mean that, um, that we would actually have access to that. Um, this project we were, was built using the archives of legal cases, testimonies, videos, uh, and images that we found in, uh, in the press. But the existence of information doesn't mean clarification. Uh, it doesn't mean reconciliation. It doesn't mean justice. Uh, because of this, even with information organized uh, in the investigation, uh, there are places that, are, that remain in darkness. This is what we call, in this case, uh, black boxes. Mm, is this a video? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, but I, but I need to share it. Sorry. Okay. Um, this project is not about the, uh, the storming or the retaking of the palace. It's not about the identification of the people that were disappeared um, or killed. It's about the organization of the forces of the state uh, that organize themselves to conduct an operation that is a counterinsurgent operation that ended precisely in the disappearance and killing of people, uh, as well as torturing and uh, other, other practices of human rights violations. Um, for this, we analyze different types of um, visual materials that we situated. Uh, what? Sorry, it didn't change. It didn't change the slide. For some reason, for them. So you guys don't see this? No. Maybe we share. It maybe it's frozen for them. Okay. This is not. And then go in the window. But like. This is the one. Yeah. No, again, she said. Do you do you see do you see the the image? Yeah, okay, that's the correct one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm gonna try to continue. Um, it's pretty much a shame, so. Utilizamos nuestro modelo como dispositivo óptico con el que observamos nuevamente. Yeah. Okay, guys, can you? Check it, so you see this? Yeah. So if this is um, 
yeah, this is this is part of the reconstruction that we made using different cameras and situating them in a 3D model. Um, we analyzed the visual material and we situated that in a 3D model that we built that we built based with uh, based on a mark, a, uh, archive archival imagery uh, images and um, the blue, the blueprints of the area and other types of uh, visual information. Um, with this uh, in mind, Jesus, it's not now. Now we hear Oscar again. So what is the problem? But okay, sorry, guys. Just to clarify, you're just supposed to be seeing a video, and you're not meant to be hearing anything. Like we we're not playing the sound because it's all in Spanish. Okay, all right. So go ahead. Sorry. So can we continue? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna... I'm going to the next slide. This one. Okay. Um, with this information, with this all material archive, uh, this material, uh, this archival material that we that we gathered, uh, that basically is made of um, different types of video footage um, that we found from on YouTube, uh, that we also gathered from different archival. Um, different archives like of like public and private uh, as well as photography that we find like doing archival work in the press um, on different places um, we organized and created categories of the images um, in order to to locate people and organize this uh, and to try to understand this logistics this organization of the of the army in the place um, we were able to through this, through, through this organization of information to categorize the images of the police, the military, uh, and the intelligence that was involved in the actions of these uh, two days uh, of 1985. And we followed um, how these different groups, the army, the military, the police, and intelligence people, the intelligence um, actors, um, created a network of counterinsurgency in charge of um, managing the hostages, the people that were freed from, from, the, from the Palace of Justice, um, and that were afterwards classified and divided between civilians and suspects. Um, suspects of being um, you know, in collusion and helping uh, the guerrilla from the inside as civilians. Um, The images of the videos are part of the, of the Colombian memory. Um, our work, more than trying to figure out new images or figure out like something that has never seen before, was to analyze and study their content and the way in which these images were made. Um, this meant that we needed to ask ourselves what the images allowed us to see, but also what the images didn't allow us and the country to see, right? Uh, what the images were not able to capture. The, the, the journalists who were part, were uh, recording the, these events um, this, uh, that happened in two days, uh, were in a constant interaction with the state army forces, um, which blocked um, the uh, vision angles and the, the places where they were able to shoot, right, and have um, sight to the events. Uh, and therefore, entire sections of the space um, were out of vision from the cameras and the journalists those two days. Uh, the visual register was, you know, started to change in these two days, right? Um, as a result of the, what, the, what the state forces allowed um, journalists to record. This process of blocking the vision created what we are calling black boxes, which are spaces of impenetrability where information is not um, available to the public eye. Um, when, when all of the information that we had available we were able to uh, synchronize uh, the different images and we were able to create a timeline 
of the two days of the event. We were able to understand how the state army forces, the different parts that constitute the state agents, um, the state armed forces, um, were organized amongst themselves when the people that were classified as suspects left the palace. So basically they left the palace that you're seeing here on the left um, and they crossed the street that you're seeing right here and they enter into this other building that you're seeing uh, that the person, this a very famous journalist, um, is, is pointing at. So um, when these people were, uh, these suspects entered the building that you're seeing on the right, which is called, uh, it's a museum called Casa del Florero. Uh-oh. Seems like their connection is bad because this is what they're seeing on the screen now. So they haven't been seeing these slides. Sorry, you, you keep presenting and I'll read you this. But I mean, it's the same thing because it's like, yeah. I'm mean, not getting. Same thing. It's a shame. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know, uh, Marilyn, if you can play the slides on your end, but it's it's a bit hard to yes. know if you guys you guys might have missed the last um, three slides. Three slides. Yeah, basically every time that I move things, it doesn't work. Yeah. Um. Anyway, I mean, we're not really sure. Should we, should you guys play the slides from your end? Go full screen. Again. Yeah, that's what I think. Mean. If we can get it better, because I don't think it's working out very well, the, the, the technical aspect, and we are getting lost in yeah. all the uh, complications. So if we can do it um, maybe tomorrow, or uh, we can talk about it, because it's, 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 it's very difficult for us to follow right now, unfortunately. Yeah. And I know that you have done an incredible effort with uh, COVID and everything, but we are not receiving the information correctly. Um, um, so what we don't um, try to um, internally even uh, discuss what we can do tomorrow and if we can try it again tomorrow or um, have some version of it um, that we can put together for, for the group because right now it's, it's honestly not, we're not hacking it at all. You know, it's, it's becoming extremely complicated to follow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's Thank impossible you. to follow this without Yeah, let's try, to, let's try tomorrow. Yeah. So, this is more or less what, um, what we wanted to um, be showing you guys, certain different kind of cases and certain different kinds of um, discussions that come around with each of the projects that we actually work on. Um, Mariana pr proposed several, we did also a few of them, and they were going to show a couple of cases that in the Colombian case, um, unfortunately, you know, doesn't come out <laughs> that great. Really appreciate your, your stamina and your commitment to this. So thank you so much. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>